For the past few months, Russia has been conducting an operation of military pressure on Ukraine. Delegations are underway between NATO nations and Russia upon fears an invasion of Ukraine will take place. As the world holds its breath, members of the Ukrainian-Canadian community express their thoughts on this ever-evolving situation. This interview was conducted on January 26th, 2022. My name is uh, Orest Kapp. I'm a professor emeritus of the uh, University of Manitoba. I guess we're all uh, feeling a little bit the pressure that is occurring right now with the Russian aggression in Ukraine and is having an impact on an international basis. So it's not something that is just local anymore. Uh, it has taken on a, a, tr a tremendous sort of uh, vision in terms of what is occurring now in the setting of Europe especially where uh, Ukraine is located. We should remember that, uh, remember or, or uh, not even forget that uh, basically Ukraine has been at war already with Russia for, eight, for over eight years now, approximately. We had 14,000 deaths during that period of time, 35,000 wounded. We had uh, over one and a half million people basically displaced because of the conflict that is occurring in that particular area. And so uh, it's creating tremendous pressure on the Ukrainian, uh, on the country itself, and also uh, on the uh, countries around Ukraine in terms of uh, what is transpiring. Because you've got Poland, you've got Romania, you've got uh, the Baltic states uh, that are all around on the, on the other side, on the western side of Ukraine. And there's always the, the, the aspect of worrying, well, are they going to be implicated in this in the long run? Another thing to remember that uh, Russia back in 94, when Ukraine was declared independence in 91, 90% of the population voted for sovereignty and independence and territorial integrity. And, uh, and so the country uh, took a democratic uh, approach to uh, make sure that Ukraine is a, a democratic country. But yet in 1994, prior to that, Russia signed a uh, Budapest Memorandum uh, with, uh, I believe it was with uh, U.S., Britain, and Russia, uh, basically indicating that they would uh, respect the sovereignty of Ukraine and also its territorial integrity, provided that Ukraine got rid of all its nuclear arsenal. As you know, Ukraine was the third largest arsenal, nuclear arsenal in Europe. And so Ukraine agreed to transfer this arsenal directly to the Russians in return for sovereignty. And so here you have Russia signing a, a memorandum or an agreement, but yet didn't abide by this international agreement. They basically neglected it. But don't be surprised. We've seen the same thing happen in Chechnya. We've seen the same thing happen in Georgia where the Russians invaded. We've seen the same thing happen in Moldova, where there's a segment right on the border of Ukraine called Transdister. And the, the, the Russians have been housed there or stayed there for over 30 years. Uh, they don't, it doesn't look like they want to leave. Uh, usually they come into the territory, and once they come in, it's hard to get them out, as one of the politicians had mentioned. Uh, However, uh, what has happened is after the Crimean, uh, Crimea Peninsula uh, invasion or annexation by the Russians uh, via their green men, if you remember that, the green men in the came in. Well, in fact, we know it's the Russians that came in. And as a result of that, this was followed by a declared war in the uh, uh, regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, and since that time in the Donetsk, Luhansk area, basically, which are puppet regime of Moscow. Moscow dictates basically what needs to transpire in those uh, areas and uses that as a, uh, as a force to negotiate in terms of what they want to get from Ukraine. But in those particular areas currently, uh, is there are Russian forces there. There are, there are military consultants there. Uh, there's extreme intense Russification of the population. That means the media, the press, the radio, the educational system, the monetary use uh, has shifted to the ruble. Uh, and on top of that, 
the Russians forced the population basically to adapt and to have Russian passports. So here you have Ukrainian territory. Ukraine doesn't have a Ukrainian passport and have now a Russian passport. And this is problematic now because what it does, it now gives the Russian another excuse to say, well, we're coming in to help our Russian, uh, fr uh, Russian friends or Russian family or Russian-speaking uh, people. But in fact, uh, during the Soviet times, nearly everybody spoke Russian. Uh, and even in Eastern Europe, uh, where Germany is and Hungary and so on, uh, the language uh, was imposed and it was Russian everywhere. But they used that as a pretext to invade uh, and to go in. Uh, so Russia basically uh, does not respect international agreements since World War II. It basically changed as a result of their annexations and the word that they've created, they've created uh, new guidelines, if you want, for what is happening in Europe. And that's problematic. The other thing is uh, uh, Ukraine wants to join NATO. Uh, and right now it's in a delay mechanism. Uh, it may happen, it may not happen uh, for uh, a period of time. How long, I don't know. But then now you have, as a result of Russian aggression, you have now Finland and Sweden saying, well, we'd like to, to join NATO also. Keep in mind, Finland at one time was neutral. Right? And during Second World War, the Russians also took a chunk of Finland away. And so rather than, uh, have, rather than having an impact uh, as a result of the requirement that Russia has put on NATO and on Ukraine, the reverse has happened. Uh, people are, want to join NATO to protect themselves from the Russian aggression. So it is, it is a major problem. Uh, the Russia, Russia basically needs to withdraw its troops from the Ukrainian border and stop threatening Ukraine. It's like having a pistol at your head. Uh, and, and take away their troops from Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea and let Ukraine live in peace. We're not, uh, we're not taking any territory from Russia. We're not invading Russia. Uh, but yet... Putin, I guess he wants to be Tsar or he wants to recreate the old Soviet Union, uh, can't seem to live with that. And so it's, it's, it's a very problematic aspect. Uh, the other aspect is also we have family in Donetsk. Uh, as I mentioned to you possibly before is we, uh, I was in there, I was in Donetsk uh, visiting them in 2005 because I had to attend the conference at Donetsk National University. Donetsk National University, my car is 20 minutes. And they live 15 minutes away from the, uh, from the front line. So on one side, you have the Russian forces and their proxies. And on the other side, you have the Ukrainian forces. And so when I spoke to our family, even during Christmas time, uh, you know, uh, for them, uh, every day is basically, it's like walking on eggs. You don't know what's going to happen or if they're going to be bombarded or not. So it is problematic. Uh, uh, Ukraine wants peace. Uh, and not only that, but when I spoke to the parents over there, they indicated to me, no, we're happy that Canada and other countries are willing to help in a variety of ways that motivates them. It, but we also, he says, we want to thank them. But the other aspect also, we're happy that the Ukrainian forces are basically protecting us. Uh, and so this is where we are pretty much in terms of what has transpired. Uh, I should mention that a number of countries are on board already, right? We we've, we've have the Netherlands, we have uh, the Baltic countries, you have Poland. Uh, I heard Japan is on board, the Czech Republic, England, uh, US, Canada. And we, we appreciate and thank all the support that they're giving to us including lately, I believe, the monetary support given by Canada uh, to help out economically. Uh, uh, we need all the support we can get economically and militarily in order that we won't be able to defend ourselves. We're not asking any countries to send their forces uh, to our country. All we're saying is help us and we will defend ourselves. Uh, this, is, this is basically a, 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 an important issue uh, that uh, if it's not resolved uh, uh, at this particular time, I'm afraid it could also just move it into the European setting. Uh, currently, what will happen is Ukraine is the platform for 
indirectly, if there is an invasion for uh, the, a war between NATO on one hand, Russia on the other hand, and the Ukrainian territory, again, is going to be bloodied. And, you know, we need to resolve this peacefully, diplomatically, but yet uh, looking at the requirements stipulated by Russia, uh, I mean, they're extremely exaggerated and impossible to, to get to some agreement. So at this stage, I don't know which way it may go, uh, but yet uh, it, it puts us all into a dilemma in terms of how to proceed at this particular stage. That's something we've seen. Um, whenever someone's an aggressor, they always try to claim people are attacking them first to justify their actions. Like we're seeing from Russia, they're saying, Oh, NATO was never supposed to move more eastward than they already have, but I don't. I don't even think that's true. My feeling is if if he does not follow the diplomatic route and decides to move in, uh, then he needs to be declared as a as a war criminal, and also the United Nations should step in and take away their vote because basically they're like a terrorist country. You know, they need they need to do something in order to address him in terms of how uh, he's thinking at this particular stage. Because, yeah, if, if things escalate to violence, then everyone loses. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it needs to be resolved diplomatically. But if you have one party, basically, that has put on paper uh, items that are uh, just unreachable, contrary to whatever they're doing, uh, it's just not going to happen. And the other thing is they're attacking NATO and the U.S. and uh, all their allies. But on the one hand, if NATO backs backtracks and follows the requirements that Moscow's put it in. Imagine now how North Korea is going to approach that, or China in the long run may approach that. They may say, well, force seems to work, uh, rather than uh, try to resolve it diplomatically. So, you know, that's an issue that has to be looked at and addressed, uh, uh, you know, as soon as possible. So what can we as the general public do in a situation like this? The only thing is, is, uh, is to... Uh, request that the uh, uh, government representatives, the MPs and others basically uh, receive emails or phone calls and say, look, we support what the Canadian government is doing. Uh, in fact, the Canadian government uh, has been supporting Ukraine for, uh, in the last eight years with uh, training. It's been training uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian armed forces and including officers on how to defend themselves from attacks from aggressors. And I believe in the latest announcement uh, that the prime minister made uh, an additional, I believe, 20 or 60 troops will be added possibly to a maximum of 400 to continue the training that the forces receive. All training is done in Western Ukraine uh, in the city of Lviv. So it's far away from the, uh, uh, the, the areas where they're uh, melting the, uh, the Russian invasion possibly. And it's important to remember that no matter what, Russia and Russian supporters say they are the aggressors in this uh, situation. Absolutely. We have to be reminded of that. Ukraine is a newly, it's only about 30 years old, a newly democratic uh, country, wants to join NATO, wants to join the European Union, wants to abide by international laws. And yet uh, you have this aggressor basically surrounding Ukraine from all sides trying to take over territories, you know, this could really get out of hand. The story is evolving rapidly. Uh, I have a news article open right now, and it's just, you know, there's updates every 15 minutes. So who knows what could happen? Well, he did get a letter from the U.S. in terms of uh, the U.S. response, how he, how the Russians will respond or put it, how he will respond. Well, you know, we have to wait and see uh, in terms of what decision he takes. But I think he's created himself a situation uh, as an aggressor. And uh, uh, it'd be interesting to see how he gets out of this. Yeah, I get, it, it's really scary because Russia seems to, like Putin seems to have backed himself into a corner. And uh, from, uh, from the latest news, I just heard that they also want to do uh, some military uh, maneuvers near Ireland and uh, actually uh, do some, I guess, some, some bombing in the sea, I guess, and, and right in the area where all the Irish fishermen are. I mean, this is absurd. Uh, it just it, this, this kind of attitude from, uh, from uh, Putin is just not, it just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my thoughts go to uh, the people of Ukraine, because I can't even, 
for us in the West, like out here in like North America, we've been so disconnected from uh, wars and like armed conflicts like that for so long. It's almost unimaginable to think about a situation like this. Well, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, this crisis, uh, it, it just takes a spark to get out of hand. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's not controlled properly, uh, you could end up with a third world war. You don't know. Uh, you know, all it takes is one missile to go in the wrong place. Uh, and, and you have a, a major situation on your hands. Uh, but I guess Russia is taking a chance or possibly bluffing. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, uh, we have to take one step at a time in terms of how we 